Um, I'm going to call the planning committee meeting of March 14th to order. Jory, if you could do the roll call. Yes. Hamaji. Here. Bentley. Here. Hines. Here. Meehan. Here. Okay. And are there any changes to our report from February 8th? No. Mm -mm. None. Okay. All right. Chair's report. Just wanted to read you a statement. The land use study will not be discussed in today's planning committee meeting. The GRF board referred this item back to the planning and finance committees for future consideration in context of an update to the facilities master plan and enterprise risk management document and their long-term financial impact on capital project funding through the trust estate fund. <laughs> Discussions involving these planning documents will take place over the next. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Good to see you. All right, I'll be getting it. I'm all too. The land use study will not be discussed in today's planning committee meeting. The GRF board referred this item back to the planning, finance, and planning and finance committees for future consideration in context of an update to the facilities master plan and enterprise risk management document and their long-term financial impact on capital project funding through the trust estate fund. Discussions involving these planning documents will take place over the next six months. The comprehensive analysis and updating of these documents will include evaluation of funding options for major capital needs and risk exposures. Capital projects for the Golden Rain Foundation are funded through collection of the membership transfer fees, also known as MTFs, from new owners. Based on the identified capital projects in the facilities master plan, funding from just the MTF at the current rate of home sales is not sufficient. Some examples of major capital projects include replacement of the MOD office facility, major renovation of the Dollar and Hillside clubhouses, and ongoing maintenance and upkeep of existing infrastructure. Major projects in the recent past, including the Recycle Center at MOD, Creekside Complex, Event Center, and the Fitness Center, were partially financed through bank loans. GRF has three outstanding loans with balances totaling approximately $14.7 million with monthly debt service being paid from the trust estate fund. The decision to partially fund these projects through debt was made at a time when John Muir Medical Center was a long-term tenant and insurance coverage included landslide, and 100% replacement property and more robust earthquake limits for GRF property. To help replace GRF assets in the event of an uninsured earthquake or landslide loss on GRF property, $250,000 per year is allocated from the collected MTFs to add to a reserve in the trust estate fund, which currently has a $3.5 million balance. While the reserve will help, it will not cover a total loss event. While the trust estate fund is financially sound at present, financial responsibility also means planning for and protecting future assets. In order to meet its fiduciary obligations, the GRF board must evaluate prudent and reasonable funding opportunities for capital projects. Because capital product, excuse me, because capital projects are not funded through the coupon, funding options include additional borrowing, increases to the MTF, and what we all want to avoid, special assessments. The intent of the land use study is to produce information to assist in evaluating options. It is not a plan to sell, and it does not include additional steps that would be required should the board ever select this as an option. While Rossmore was originally zoned for 7,350 homes, any decision to excuse me, any decision to expand beyond the current 6,676 homes would involve considerable community input. 
along with significant regulatory oversight from the city and other agencies. There are currently no plans to sell parcels owned in, by GRF. There has been no contact with developers. There has been no marketing or outreach to the city. The proposed land use study was an initial step to provide information to be used in the larger context of funding options based on capital priorities and needs. The GRF board operates with complete transparency and with that comes the airing of ideas and proposals for board and community deliberation. There will be many more discussions about capital projects and funding options in the future and residents will will be well aware of any efforts through open meetings of the planning committee, finance committee, and board meetings. Okay, now we'll move on to the capital project update. Anne, if you would. Thank you. So committee members. <laughs> so I just wanna back up before we catch up to what we're looking at today. So through the capital, budget proposal process, we went through a different format and we used a tool that was showing us um, kind of in a format very similar to this, the different projects, the cost and projections. And so the reason we were going this is we wanted to try to create a model that we could end up using then as we discuss capital projects from committee to committee. So the purview of this committee is really how are the projects going? What are the updates? And then because we did a priority system, consideration of either elevating a priority or deferring a project or something like that. So this is what this committee would focus on. And so what I'm proposing to you today is this is the format that we use moving forward to report on projects to the cap to the planning committee. Um, as it goes to the finance, there'd be some columns added to this format that would show the spending to date because they get a little bit more into um, the actual expenditures as they're occurring. Um, and then this would be kind of the blueprint to start next year's capital budget and we would add to it. So um, I can review what's here and then please we can talk about the projects and also the format itself because it's just like with the capital, we want to make sure that this is a tool that is actually meaningful. So this replaces community. the form you were using yeah. before. Because the last form had it had the project, mm -hmm. the total, it had the descriptions of the project in it, right. and then it had a comment update. But in the last model that you used, it wasn't tracking the cost, but it was also quite a different format. And so going from one meeting to another, it was sometimes the numbers didn't add up because it was all kind of everything was hand entered into. Okay, good. I think this will be more streamlined for you. That's true for us. I just, yeah. Did anybody have a question? Yeah. I had a quick question about the um, in the second priority the roof replacement program. Is that all roofs on a regular schedule? Yes. Yeah, so, is that right? So typically there are roofs that happen around the um, camp. I keep calling the campus through the, throughout the valley that are on different replacement schedules. So this year in 2024, that 165 thousand is for the skylight project. There's the skylight roof okay. area at That's the fitness center. If you look out to 2027, there's areas of gateway that are scheduled to be replaced at that time. Okay. So those are things which become more like the, the maintaining the stuff we have. Okay. So just to clarify for the residents, so this year it's the skylights and the orig original roof of the fitness center, yes. not the new roof. Correct. Okay. I have some questions, but I'm going to wait to shoot my cover after she goes through her okay. thing. So I'm just taking notes and I'll do it at the end. Okay. okay. So currently, um, I'll just start with the priority one items because those are the ones that are active. So for the gateway phase two studio renovation, um, it's substantially complete. There are different punch items that we're looking at, and there were even some things from the phase one. Um, that looked like they kind of deteriorated a little. And so since the contractor is still on site, we're having him just take a look at a few fixes for us. Um, for the pickleball courts. So um, we continue to be in plan review with the city of Walnut Creek. So we've been in this state for probably, uh, it, it really started in, ja in January. Um, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's a, there's some complexities to it because there are a lot of things that the city's doing their due diligence with. 
Um, it's just the experience that we're having with the city. We have another project that's happening with the pool roof structure that also is still in plan review. Um, and the city of Walnut Creek we're finding is they leave no stone unturned when it comes to um, code or regulation. And they really like to run us through the gauntlet. So we've been working with them um, regarding the pickleball courts. We actually did a site visit with the team that's reviewing it from the city. And we found it to be really effective. Um, they hadn't been to Rossmore. Um, and it was really good for them to really understand the actual, uh, like in the context versus just looking at a plan. And also we learned some things about the city too, which I think are influencing the delay. They're staffing for plan review. They, are, they have half the number of assistant planners that they did before COVID and people are still on um, remote schedules. So it's creating some workflow issues on their part. Um, okay, so then the Tice roof structure, we submitted what we believe are the last comments because it was really just an administrative change they wanted in a plan set that we provided to them. And so we're hoping to get the permit for the roof soon. Um, for those of you that are um, swimming, aficionados here in the room or if, if anybody's on Zoom, um, when we get the permit, it doesn't mean we're gonna close the pool and do this installation. It's really important that we try to time this so we don't have any further disruption. As everybody knows, the lap pool was down for repairs and hopefully uh, you will have received or will receive a nixle soon that we're opening it today at one o'clock. So the repair was done well ahead of schedule thanks to our facilities team. Um, but what we're trying to do is to time any of those capital projects that will create a closure to happen at those hottest months of the year when really the climate inside the natatorium becomes, it's exceeding 100 degrees sustained. So it'll probably be more towards um, end of August, September, or, or maybe even later, we'll take a look at weather and push it as far out as we can. And I just wanna to jump to the, um, there's at the bottom of the list of the number ones is the Tice pool and spa replastering. Um, so we have an approved contract we're going to coordinate that work also so it happens contiguous to the roof so when we close the pool we close it once to do that whole rehab and then um 2025 it'll be a perfect programming year so everybody thank you for your patience um when you have these capital assets uh they do take quite a bit of maintenance i think everyone needs to be reminded that um you know our fitness center it's bright and shiny and new but it was built from an older facility. And so, you know, this, this repair is kind of, is, it's very common, it's expected, and, you know, we're, we're getting hit with everything this year. All right, so we did pickleball bar, tight pool. The alternate, alternate transfer pump, um, that's a component that we are waiting for the arrival of the parts so we can finish that repair. That was a carryover from last year. For the GenArc replacement, this is now the NetSuite implementation and we are underway and staff just began meeting with the NetSuite team to talk about migration of all this data that we have into um, NetSuite so then we can start then using it for all the different program areas. I just wanna jump back one. Absolutely. The alternate transfer pump, that's not a, re that's not a, a rebuild, that's a brand new project, isn't it? Isn't that the one for recovering water from uh, irrigation and everything so. and not letting it get to the stream and pumping yeah. it right straight? Yes. That's right. Um, yes. So that's that's a brand new project and not a, you made it sound like we were- It was carried over though, because we couldn't oh, get the parts. Okay. So it's it's not new in the effect that we carried it over from 2023 because okay. they were waiting for a part. Because we haven't, this Thank is the first, we haven't actually right. implemented it and seen it working yet. Okay. You know, that's what I was trying Thank to say. Thank you for that clarification. Um, golf bridge replacement. So this year, what's funded is a is a basically it's a scoping study. And I want to um, for those people that that um, sometimes they hear study and you get this collective A. <laughs> it's funny. So with capital projects, scoping studies are very important. It's part of the anatomy of a capital project because what we want to do is make sure we put the execution plan with the bridges in particular that we make sure we understand what is required of every, every regulatory agency before we move ahead. So we have contracts in place with our environmental firm and our engineering firm. Um, and so we've begun the work 
to address that project and have the bridges designed this year so we can do replacement next year. Yes, Ted. <laughs> And is that is that study going to have uh, the the single bridge as part of the study too, rather than having? The, we're, we're talking about if, six, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. they're going to exam they're going to examine that because that save us a lot of yeah. money. If we didn't have to build two bridges there. We could do one bridge for the crossing yes. over there for everything. Yeah, they'll examine it and pretty much come up with options. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have a, well, just a comment. Can you elaborate a little bit on? The importance of these studies because we're dealing with multiple jurisdictions. Yeah. So what's so this is an interesting thing, and I had a I had a question from someone saying, okay, so let me so whenever you cross a waterway, yeah, or whenever you do work on a waterway, you have um, it's it's the water board, it's it's a uh, fish and wildlife, um, and so there are different things that they want to see. And it was interesting, there was somebody said, well, could the solution be to make the bridge span so it's further away from the creek? You actually can't because you, you've created a shadow on the water and that affects <laughs> water life. We did ask them and that was the answer. And I, uh, you know, we thought we had a workaround, but no, no, no. Um, and so it becomes a little bit complex because then when you're working with the environmental organizations, the types of materials that you use, I mean, it's, it's rather, um, you know, they have a menu, they have a palette of things that you can use or not use. So it's things that seem like intuitive, and we have a lot of, what do they call that stuff? Riprap. Riprap. Riprap against the creeks, that really shouldn't be there anymore. And it seemed like something that could really help with erosion. Um, it's, it's not environmentally friendly, so we can't use things like that. So it ends up being like planting schemes and different types of ways to use more natural formations to slow and make the water flow go to different places. So, you know, you're working different environmental forms, you're working with um, like hydrologists to talk about the flow of the water and like what's gonna slow it down. And it just becomes all these different things to coordinate. The wonderful thing, uh, we do have this amazing project manager that Fred Ponce who is leading that and coordinating all of these different groups um, so we can get the best solution. So the study is important is because it's kind of like, you know, measure twice, cut once. The worst thing to do is like, oh yeah, we can figure this out. And you just kind of jump into it. And the next thing you know, you have somebody knocking at your door that's saying, you know, you really should have run it by this review or these considerations, you know, should have happened. Um, so we vet all that out. We make sure all of those approving agencies are signed onto it and then we proceed. Then we bid it out and we proceed with it. So it gives us all the information we need. We know so that when we proceed, Next year, it's a known cost versus, oh, let's just put a placeholder and guesstimate what it's going to be. We want to really know the cost of what it's going to be. So it just helps us be more accurate as well in budgeting. And as many projects as there are, that's very important. <laughs> okay. Uh, the network gear replacement, which is after the bridges. So the network gear replacement, that's a lot of the um, equipment that's needed in order to be able to support this very robust um, new IT system that we have and actually to make the things that we have right now work properly. The network gear, it's really about how much data going into and out of a system it can handle. Basically, it's the highway for all of the data exchanges that happen with all the different teams throughout GRF using um, the network, and so that upgrade is in progress right now. And then with the Tice pools or plastering, I did I did mention that we um, you know we have the contractor that we'll work with. Um, they're holding your bid until we can coordinate work towards the end of the year. And so that's everything that we have right now in progress, and everything else is on hold. Yes. Why the <clears throat> maybe this is for Jeff? Why do we have the network gears out uh, with costs for the next? Four years, you know, five years, <clears throat> starting out at a half a million bucks on twenty twenty four. I I, got, I know about the newest one because I know we got to get those gears. Is this something that just wears out, or is it time itself out because it it can't keep up with things? It's actually a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, and so I think so. What IT is trying to do is, you know, get the the biggest part of what is needed right now for this, this whole migration to NetSuite that we need. But I think everybody knows this, um, like technology keeps, basically it makes a lot of things obsolete. And so what they're trying to do is to look at the components 
that tend to kind of innovate more quickly and project. So that's a placeholder. Again, it's one of those things, you know, um, if the pavement plan is about the, the physical roads that we have, that kind of network here, that's the technology, technological roads that we need to do our business to. And so that, so it's not a one and done. You kind of have to expect that there's gonna be regular maintenance on that as well. But it may or may not be this amount of money Correct. depending on what we need each year. Correct, so those are estimates. And so anything that you see in the future years, they're estimates when we put the budget together because we only approve like year to year, um, we will have more accurate numbers. But it kind of helps give the long range pick the long range view that, you know, just because we're done with those, you know, one set of projects, it doesn't mean that we've got a bunch of them flying at us that are going to come at us in the future. And so we really thought for the planning committee, it might be good to see that because as you know, because if there's projects that you're considering, it's just good to see kind of the, at least the regular maintenance things. And so hopefully we're going to be perfecting that a little bit more as a team, because even for the staffing team, this was a new way to show the capital budget. I just have to say, this is already an incredible yeah. Yeah. advancement from last year. So this is great. Thank you. All right. You're good? I'm you're good, good if you are. Okay. okay. All right, we're going to move on to item number six, unfinished business. And Anne, if you could give an update on the food and beverage study timeline. Yes. Well, into your agenda packet, I did include a timeline um, for the study. And so if people have been following the project, we, have, we are working with a company called Synergy. And one of the things that was quite outstanding about them, even through the RFP process, which is a little bit of exchange, asking questions you know, before they do the submittal and then doing the presentation, um, they have a very flexible approach. I will say they're very accommodating. And they understand when you do studies like this, with a population like this, I mean, your, your residents here, they really kind of understood that the process may be informed. It may take a little changes as they get information from each of the different community engagement um, processes. So for that reason, when you look at that timeline, just realize this is a guide. It's something that we want to stick to because we do, you know, we want to get to the end by about September. Um, but we also, and so we built in a little bit of, you know, time in case there were like a few turns in there. Um, but it's a guide, and as we give updates here, you may see components added, you may see things say things that change or deleted. So we'll try to update that if there are substantial changes. And so I just want to tell you what's happening like right now. So what we're working on is project mess, like the, the formal project messaging to the community and launch will happen. I think it's like the first Rossmore News issue in April. And there's going to be a really there's going to be a survey that people will be able to fill out online, but the paper survey will be a full page in the Rossmore News, um, and so that's going to be a really big first kickoff to really start stimulating conversation and get input from the entire community about the vision for food service. Um, additionally, what's happening is stakeholder interviews have begun, and they're really starting with um, you know, the planning committee members and the board. And from those initial stakeholders, other people will be identified. We're going to interview our current restaurant owner. Um, so we're just beginning that to get a lay of the land for, um, again, this is all like really just base a lot of information in on what these expectations, the vision is for food service. And also there's lots of evaluation of things. So I've had to send a lot of documents like the restaurant lease, demographics on the community, um, all different types of um, any data that we have. So right now they're kind of in that, um, it's a lot of fact finding for them about the community. And all that information about each stage will be put in the Rossmore News and discussed here as well. Yes. Okay. All right. Any questions in the committee? <laughs> Again, that information is in the board packet for those who are interested. All right, we'll move on to item 6B. Um, Leanne, could I ask a question? I'm going to share my screen again in the same chart that we just saw. Um, so we have a recommendation. We, um, we're proposing a recommendation to the GF board to include the Buckeye Tennis Court resurfacing project as a priority one project. Um, at the January 25th meeting, the board approved the capital budget with these different priorities and essentially what we're trying to do is to be a little bit um you know prudent about expending the capital budget 
kind of waiting until the pickleball um, bids came through before we were like released everything. And so the priority one projects that were approved were really things that needed to happen because of safety, their carryover. So you're at the end of a project anyway from the prior years or something that would like over, like really obviously disrupt the ability for a program to go through. The two, the two had a real high necessity as well, but they could be delayed a little bit because we thought we had a high likelihood of getting, um, you know, bids by the end of the year, even if somewhere in the second quarter, you know, we could get an approval to go ahead. But where we are with the tennis courts and keeping tabs with our vendors, there are like there are fewer vendors for tennis courts, for instance, than certainly pavement or roof replacement. Um, but the event center tech, we actually had to get a bid from a vendor we know we'd work with. So basically, it's a, as long as it's approved, we know they, they have the equipment as a short timeline. Tennis is a little bit different. There might be like three really good vendors locally, and we've been reaching out with them to say, hey, what is your project load this year? You know, how far can we delay it before now it's going to get kicked into 2025? So we're kind of at that point now. Um, optimistically, they could get something on the schedule six months, but it could be as long as nine months. And since we're, you know, in March, we thought it was, um, and, you know, we were asked to look at this by the committee. And so um, we think it's, it's appropriate to ask that this become a level one priority. So this cost is uh, 125,000 in this year. You'll see it broken into two years. It's because we wanna do just the resurfacing of one through six. Court seven and eight had other types of issues which were a little bit more invasive. And so we um, proposed that for the next calendar year. So the request would be um, to ask the board to consider advancing this as a priority one and authorize staff to, to proceed with the project for 125,000. Okay, so the motion is really just to place it into priority one because you're going to then pursue bids yeah. and yeah. research of bids. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. I move that the Buckeye Tennis Court resurfacing be moved to priority one for this year. Okay. Do we have to say for what for the parameters on yeah. it? That's from courts one to six, or do we have to say anything like that? It's not because I don't want them to think it's the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would, it would okay. hurt. <laughs> yeah, let's right. specify. I move that the Buckeye Tennis Court resurfacing for courts one through six be moved from priority two to priority one for the year 2024 for a total of 125,000. Well, we don't know yet. We don't, we don't know the total yet, okay. so we'll okay. wait till we go to the board. Okay. Yeah. We'll second. Okay, Ted seconds it. Any further discussion on that? Okay, can you do a roll call? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Hines? Yes. Meehan? Yes. Okay, All right. Now we're gonna move on to new business, item seven, uh, an update on the solar project. And Jeff, can you give us that? Yeah. So this is uh, one of our projects that has been a goal of the board and has been around now for a little while and was certainly impact, impacted by the, the pandemic and uh, has continued to be impacted as uh, electrical components are one of the main items that still are affected by the supply chain. And one of the main parts of this project uh, also included work with pg and &E, and they had to upgrade, they have to upgrade a significant uh, portion of their system to accept the load coming from the uh, system. But the good news is uh, those issues are starting to get resolved. We are once again ready to resume this project. And just to give you a reminder, uh, currently we have a one megawatt system that is off of Rockview that offsets about 50% of GRF facility uh, associated electric meters. This project for phase two includes carport canopies, which you see on the screen there, that would occupy the parking lot at Gateway as well as uh, we would have solar panels on the new pickleball courts once those are created, as well as on the roof of the event center. There won't be carport canopies at uh, the event center. 
The phase two is designed to pretty much take us to full offset of our electrical uh, usage with all of GRF associated meters. So we will essentially be off the grid, if you will, uh, in terms of our electric usage uh, and replace that with the solar. With uh, the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act, it was looking for a while like we would be able to either do a lease or an outright purchase of this system and that GRF would be able to receive uh, through a program called Direct Pay the tax incentives, which are about 30%. Uh, those really are critical in funding a project such as this to make it pencil out over the long term in terms of the, the savings. However, based on our, our filing status and GRF's tax appetite, we don't have uh, any revenue to offset by our tax liability to offset by the tax credit. So GRF really can't take advantage of that tax incentive uh, so thus, as we did with phase one, we are looking at a PPA option with the, the ability to buy that out after uh, 10 years. That allows a, another a third party entity to take that tax credit and thus pass it more or less through to, to GRF in the form of payments. It also allows for a third party, uh, they are responsible for the system and have to maintain the system and do all of the, the upkeep. So there are some benefits. You just, you don't quite realize the savings as you would if you owned it yourself. Um, so we'll be bringing that to the finance committee to talk about in a little bit more detail. Today, I just wanted to remind the committee these were published quite a few years ago, but it gives you a sense that uh, the canopies will occupy pretty much the same layout of the parking lot as it is today. This is a, a view from across the street. We wanted to be mindful of sharing what the neighbors will experience uh, once this is in place. Do you have the other slide? Oh, I think I have to do this. So this is actually uh, trying to duplicate if you were across the street, what it would look like if you're looking out your, your window at those. Um, they are high enough that uh, our delivery vehicles, our tour buses and that sort of thing can still access and drive underneath. Uh, certainly should provide a nice uh, shade for some of those vehicles or when we have farmer's market and that sort of thing. The final design uh, is still being tweaked because there are some, with solar projects like this, you don't need to do the accessibility upgrades or the parking lot upgrades that you would if you were doing a, a construction type project. But we do want to be mindful of that. So we're looking at what needs to happen in the gateway parking lot to make sure it, it's coordinated with this project. So there, there will be a few tweaks to the overall layout, uh, but this gives you a good flavor of what it will actually look like. Do these have to be sprinklered because they're um, over cars? They do not. There uh, is some code requirements in terms of how much square footage you, you have, so they're broken up accordingly. We did that with the phase one uh, for the, the canopies that go around the RV lot. Uh, you just have to be mindful of how many square feet you, you cover with the, with the shades. It's not a continuous um, structure. I think there's one more overview. Carol, you. Carol yeah. question. Um, I would like to know what the plan is when the parking lot is filled with construction. Yeah. What are we going to do with the cars? There will definitely be some coordination uh, challenges with uh, the parking lot. We will have to stage construction so it's not we close the whole parking lot at, at once, which you know we create some additional expense with uh, construction because you're you know mobilization and everything else. But we just have no other option because we can't shut down the entire parking lot. Uh, but in terms of do we increase shuttles? Do we do that sort of thing? We'll have to. And when do you think this will get into operation? Hopefully we'll uh, get under construction by sometime this summer. Mm -hmm. The goal is to get this project done before 2025. Questions? Another question? <clears throat> um, 
there was a lot of hold up with pg and &E on getting the right switches or whatever their technical term is for the parts that they needed on it. Has that all been resolved? Because we've been looking at this for a little while now. Everything has been submitted to pg and &E and they've had, they estimated their lead time was about a year to get those. We're right about that mark. So we, we should be in good shape with that. Just one last question. Um, this is going back to history, but uh, I think it was maybe up to two years ago um, with the phase one, there was some question of why it wasn't producing what we had expected. Was that, how did that turn out? You're measuring the, the actual savings when you're talking about pg and &E and all of the additional uh, costs that they put into their meters. And then also when we had the pandemic and our usage dipped significantly because our facilities were closed and coming out. So uh, we did have solar technologies look at that. We made some adjustments to the meters that were being offset to better maximize the savings. And I think overall, we found that it really was performing like we expected it to. It just, in, in reading those uh, bills and reporting on that, especially with the closure of so many facilities. Confusing, okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, thanks for that update. Okay. Leanne, this is Dwight. Could I ask a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. May, may I speak? No, Dwight. Oh, Dwight. Oh, Dwight. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, hi. Uh, Jeff, so uh, what is going on with the event, the event center and solar panels? I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't get the first part of your question. Event center. event center and solar panels. So the event center will include panels on the roof of the event center as well as the new pickleball complex. That portion of phase two will, will come a little bit later, especially once we know more about the uh, pickleball uh, complex when that's ready to roll. Okay. Okay, Dwight. Sorry. We're gonna lose power. I understand we do have some power outages <laughs> throughout the valley, yeah, so with the wind, it's yeah. all right. Switching. Now, I think we'll move on to residence forum. So, Tori, if you could read the instructions, yes, okay. Residents have up to two minutes to address the committee. The committee does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the residence forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented, and members do consider them as they act during the meeting. Speakers must conduct themselves with proper decorum consistent with community standards Standards that would not be offensive to a reasonable person as determined at the sole discretion of the GRF board. Participants may not engage in personal attacks, threats of any kind, or any other disruptive behavior. Speakers violating these rules may be expelled from the meeting and precluded from speaking at future meetings as determined by the board in-person forum instructions. Complete the residence forum slip and then give your slip to the chair. Copies of handouts or notes should also be given to the chair. Zoom forum instructions. If you wish to address the committee, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residence forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residence forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Okay, Jory's gonna give the names of the next person to come up and speak. We ask that you sit over there or stand because our mic is over here. So we have to have you speak, project out um, and be in that position. So who is our first speaker? And I apologize if I pronounce anyone's name incorrectly. Um, Donna Joy Nuzo. Here. I would like to urge the GRF and this committee. Could you give your name and street address? Oh, sure. Donna Joy Nuzo, N E U. Z is in zebra, I-L, 3324 Ptarmigan Drive, 2C, 
I would like to urge the GRF and this committee to please drop the idea of new residential construction in Rossmore. When I bought my unit, I was assured that Rossmore was built out. There would be no more residential construction. Alas, this has been battered around now for some time. And once again, I urge you to please uh, drop this idea now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jory, next person. Catherine Tate. Kathy Tate, uh, 5333 Terra Granada, Unit 4B. So good morning and thank you for taking my comments and thanks for the update on the land use. I am here to speak about that and speak my views as being strongly opposed that development as well as the sale of the garden area. Like others, I was told that Rossmore was built out when I purchased my condominium in 2020 the natural beauty and open space of Rossmore factored very, very heavily in my decision to move here. As I live in Mutual 50 on Terra Granada, our mutual will immediately feel the negative impact of development on the hillside located directly behind me. When I wake up in the morning, I look out my bedroom window at that hillside and it brings me great joy and peace to look at that open hillside it, it reminds me that there's still open space and natural beauty when you live in a high density area. It, it just brings me a lot. And then at night, there's owls hooting and talking to each other and mating calls. And it's just uh, the greatest thing for, for me. And I hike up there almost weekly. And the raptors are all over there. And who knows what else that we would displace wildlife. Um, it would be an immeasurable loss to all of us, both present and future residents, to have further development and to have the garden area sold. Selling land to generate. Seconds. So, so, okay. At a minimum, the quiet and tra tranquility so treasured by us will be disrupted for a significant period of time during construction and will be exposed to the pollution of construction and dirt. In addition to the evacuation process, which is already super complicated. So anyway, thank you so much. Next we have Emily Van Fleet. Hello, I'm Emily Van Fleet, 3761 Terra Granada, Unit 1B. And I am president of the tennis club. And I'm here just to uh, acknowledge and appreciate the fact that the tennis club court resurfacing has been hopefully uh, moved up as a priority. We have kept track of the usage of the tennis court for a couple of years now. And we have monthly about 1500 people, many of them uh, repeats using the courts and the resurfacing project is really critical. Um, there's been significant deterioration of the courts just over the past few months. Uh, cracks have become fissures. Um, the other day I was playing and it come, a couple of pieces of the court came up um, and it's really important for the maintenance to have it scheduled as soon as possible. Um, I do worry we've had a few folks who've actually tripped, um, had their sneakers caught on some of the court divots, and it's 
it's dangerous and I hate to see have some of the courts have to be shut down because they're unsafe to play. So it's really just a vote for getting the resurfacing done as soon as possible. Thanks. Next we have Melanie Rose. Thank you, Melanie Rose, 2000 Pine Knoll, Unit 4. Um, I appreciate the update. Um, I'm also happy to hear that the facilities study um, is going to be updated, and I really, really hope that that includes an updated resident survey um, on what their thoughts are and also what their, what their needs are. Um, but one thing that's clear from the update is that um, the board is going to continue to look for ways to finance capital projects. And so, I want us to really look at how we're categorize, categorizing capital projects. We have resident projects, such as the tennis courts and the pool and things like that. And then we also have projects such as new MOD offices and new computers for MOD, new systems. And so I think we need to separate out resident amenities from the cost of running a property management company within GRF. Um, those costs are a lot millions and millions, potentially tens of millions of dollars. Plus, it's also, um, from a, uh, just a monthly aspect, the biggest part of everyone's coupon. Um, so I think we need to really think about how sustainable that is um, and also give residents visibility into exactly how much that's costing uh, all of us. Um, I also appreciate the uh, capital uh, project updates, but I was hoping that Anne was going to review the medical center expenditures of half a million dollars. Um, the, the, only, the prior uh, documents only listed the $160,000 uh, you know, use study. So I was just curious what that $500,000 was for. Thank you. Okay. Next we have Kathleen Solaris. Hello, Kathleen Solera, 1710 Stanley Dower Drive, 2B. Keep the gardens. Every day that goes by is another day extending the mental and physical distress to our gardeners and their supporters. Please keep our much loved gardens in place as they are. And I want to thank the board and the people in this committee for your help. We appreciate the work that you do. We all do. Thank you. Next is Barbara Whitman. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara Whiteman, 1601 Oakmont Drive, number one. Uh, this morning, I, instead of uh, making my own statement, I'm going to read a statement from our membership director who can't be here because of medical reasons, but she did want to make sure that she, um, that you heard what she had to say. Rossmore is an outstanding community as it exists with current amenities that are currently available. Building more, having more is always nice, but not always necessary. Rossmore continues to attract significant numbers of new buyers. In recent years, substantial sums of money have been spent on studies, water reclamation, food, catering options, pickleball, medical center conversion, et cetera. I ask that GRF take a responsible fiduciary approach to the funds that are generated by the residents here. Spend only what you have. Focus on maintaining the assets that already exist. Do not cast about for additional funds by doing yet another study that could involve disrupting the space of a well-established garden that cannot be easily moved or by proposing construction in an area that was identified as built out. Capital plans developed in prior years must be adapted or abandoned to meet current financial realities. Times change. Costs change, needs change. Please be responsible. Okay, next we 
Next is Ann Foreman. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Ann Foreman, 5333 Terra Granada Drive 1A in Kathy's building. <laughs> so I'm here to also urge you totally drop the land use study. Um, I don't want to repeat what Kathy says. I look out at that wonderful open space. I bought my unit for that reason and was told it was built out. But the person who just spoke about the budget, I think that's really important because you are planning it. I'm looking at the re priorities one, two, three, four. Maintenance is really important. Priorities one and two. But when you talk about upgrading dollar, upgrading hillside, moving MOD, I also question, is this really what you should be doing if the money isn't there. I think about myself, I have a 23 year old Toyota Camry. Well, I'd like to have a Tesla, but I just keep the Camry going. It doesn't look good, but it gets me there. So in tune with what the previous speaker said, please don't approve capital projects when the money is not there pay for it. Our final speaker is Rosemary Black. Rosemary Black, 5951 Autumnwood Drive 2B. Um, <clears throat> we, our group has noticed that the website has been scrubbed of the information that states that Rossmore is built out. I just want to alleviate any, you know, buddy that might be upset about this. We do have screenshots and printouts of the website, how it was when we relied on that information that Rossmore is built out. And we have them in a secure location. Secondly, we also have copies of the newspaper articles throughout the years that says Ross Moore is built out. And we also have those in a secure location just in case there's a fire or flood at the newspaper office and you think you can scrub that information. We have copies. Thank you. But online. No one online. Okay. No further speakers. Thank you everybody for coming forward. I just I just want to make a comment that if anybody had concerns about uh, following the capital budget or the operating budget, those figures for capital budget are discussed every month in this meeting and at the finance committee meeting and at the board meeting. If you're following operational uh, finances, which are funded by the coupon, those discussions are held in the finance committee and the board meeting every month. So if you have access to the packet, you'll see those figures every month. Um, okay, we're going to move on to nothing. <laughs> we are done. done. Next meeting. The next meeting. But I do want to remind committee members that we're doing a photo shoot after this, so please stay. And our next meeting will be Thursday, April 11th at 10.30 in the morning. Thank you, everybody.